Welcome to Baldur's Gate 3, a brand new CRPG based on Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. If you're feeling a little overwhelmed, or you're completely new to this, or you're just looking to touch up on some of your knowledge, you're in the right place as I have the ultimate beginner's guide for you. So sit back, relax, and let's jump right into it. Let's start off with movement, and this will be a quick one. So if you're using mouse and keyboard, many of you are probably aware by now that this game is a point-and-click game. However, you can actually hold down your left mouse button and wherever you point the cursor is where your character will go, and you can even run in circles. Also note that WASD will pull the camera away from your character, and then the middle wheel button on your mouse will allow you to rotate that camera. If you want to return back to your party, you can double-click on their portraits, or you can actually press F1, F2, F3, or F4, each one representing a different party member. Also note that you can use the middle mouse button to scroll in the third-person view. And this brings us into the chain link system. If you'd like to separate a party member from the group, simply grab their portrait, pull away, and let go, and that party member will now move separate from the group, and the group will not follow them. If you want to group that party member back up, you can also grab the portrait and drop it on top of the other portraits. A really quick way for separating all party members is by pressing the hotkey G, and you'll notice that all the portraits separate from each other when I press G, and if I press G again, it puts all the portraits back together. Also note if you press shift C while all of your party members are grouped together it will put the entire group into stealth and shift C will also bring them out of stealth. Next up are the ancient sigil circles. So as you are adventuring around Faerun make sure to look for these yellow sigils right here which are actually fast travel points. Now once you discover them you actually don't ever have to click on the sigil itself. All you got to do is go to your map and then click on one of the locations here and it will teleport you right to that sigil. You can do this pretty much from almost any area Area in the game there's a few places where you can't fast travel speaking of fast travel you can go to your party's camp at most points in the game if you hit the m button or click on the little icon right here at the top of the list is the waypoint for your camp or you can click on the little bonfire icon down here at the bottom right of the screen and on the very bottom if you click on go to camp your party will teleport all the way to your party's camp in the daytime. Now on to one of the most important topics in Baldur's Gate 3, and that is resting. So if you click on the little bonfire icon down here on the bottom right, on the top, you can take a short rest. And a short rest will restore 50% of your hit points and also restore certain class features that are able to regain things on a short rest. And also there's some weapon attacks and weapon-specific skills in this game that will also recharge on a short rest. All you gotta do is click on the button, 50% HP, and then certain things are are also restored and it doesn't actually take you anywhere now at some point you are going to have to take a long rest and a long rest will bring you to your actual party's camp for you to go to bed long resting will restore pretty much everything on your character all your spell slots all your weapon abilities it does everything that a short rest does and much much more long resting is also important to progress the story as you can see i'm back at my camp right here and shadow heart has an exclamation point above her head telling us that she wants to have a chat with us and probably a very important important chat. When you're done with your dialogue duties, simply click on the bedroll and then all of a sudden you gotta figure out what kind of food supplies you need to, to be able to take that rest. Now if you're playing on balanced mode, it costs you 40 camp supplies to have a successful long rest. And if you're playing on tactician, it actually costs 80. As long as you have camp supplies and you're picking these up as you play the game, all you gotta do is click on auto select and it will put those supplies up there for you, but sometimes the number's a little bit too high and if it's a little bit too high, you may have to just mess around a little bit with what you have. If you find yourself in a situation where you don't have any camp supplies, well, it's not the end of the world, but next time you do go into the world, you definitely wanna search for camp supply packs, check all the barrels, grab as much food as you possibly can, but if you don't have it and you're trying to rest, you can also take a partial rest, which will restore your hit points and spell slots but only up to half of their maximum and you won't regain any of your short rests. So every time you take a long rest, you also regain your short rests. And as you guys can see, you get two short rests per one long rest. One more important thing to note, after you take a long rest, you will wake up at your camp in the morning time. You can actually click on your map and teleport to any waypoint that you want, but if you click on the actual bedroll, it will teleport you to exactly the place that you left before to take the long rest. Since I just mentioned camp supplies, which are very important for taking a long rest, left alt, if you're on mouse and keyboard, is going to be your best friend as you're out in the world adventuring. Hold down left alt and it will reveal all of the lootable objects in your immediate vicinity. As you can see right here, we have a traveler's chest. If I click on it, voila, there's actually a supply pack within it, which is 40 camp supplies. Very important to loot things as you adventure out in the world. All right, now let's talk about all this mumbo jumbo at the bottom of the screen, starting off with what's next to the camp and resting menu, and that is entering turn-based modes. You can either click right here or you can press shift and space, which will put the game into turn-based mode. Now, why would you go into turn-based mode? 
let's say that this was an enemy wolf and this wolf was kind of patrolling this little under rock area. Once the wolf faces to the left, I may enter into turn-based mode and then my character can actually sneak right behind him. And then once we get past the wolf, we can either let the wolf take his turn or we can just exit turn-based mode by pressing shift and space again or clicking on this little small icon right here and get the hell out of there. Entering turn-based mode can be great for pickpocketing and also for traps. Let's say that there was a trap in this little area and these blades were swinging. I would enter into turn-based mode, the blades would stop, and then I may be able to navigate through on my turn and then exit turn-based mode and the trap will resume. Moving left from right, we now have our hot bars. And you can expand this menu once you get enough skills, once you get to level five or six, you can click this little plus button and make it much, much bigger. By default, and to get to this default setting, you click on this little red diamond right here. On the right side, you have items that you have placed on your hotbar from your inventory. Some of these items may auto place on that hotbar depending on what your settings are. In the middle, you have your class actions. So I'm playing a ranger and we have hunter's mark, long strider spells that I took for the ranger class specifically. And then to the left of that, we have our common actions such as throw, disengage, jump, and also our weapon-specific attack. So if we take a look at my inventory here, you can see that I have the Everburn Blade, and the Everburn Blade comes with Pommel Strike, Lacerate, and also Cleave, and all of those weapon attacks will be over on the left side of the screen right here in the Common category. You can also click on these tabs at the bottom. If I click on Common, it shows me nothing but those common actions and weapon attacks. If I click on Ranger, it's all of my Ranger-specific ones, and actually, let's go over to Shadowheart. If we click on Cleric, you can see all of my Cleric spells right here. If we click on items, we see nothing but the items that we have in our hotbar. And then passives, just make sure to check to see what passives that you have. Some of these may come with the gear that you get, but everybody starts with a passive called toggle non-lethal attack. So if you put this on, it will toggle it on on all of your party members at the same time. And then when you attack an enemy with a melee attack, that attack will not actually kill them. It will knock them unconscious. And then of course, we also have the custom hotbar where you can do whatever you want by dragging skills and items into this hotbar. If you press K as a spellcaster, this will bring up your spellcasting menu and all your spells right here. You can simply just grab a spell and drop it on the custom bar. Also note that you can take these little red dividers and pull them left and right, and you can lock your hotbar. Bar. By default, it is locked, but if you need to unlock it to move things around, feel free to do so. But remember to lock it again because I remember early on when I used to play this game, I would grab a spell by accident and I'd let go and then it would disappear. And I don't even know that I have that spell because I'm not that familiar with the spells in the game and I don't even know how to get the spell back. So it's better to just lock the hot bar after you're done messing with it and then you can't actually lose any of your spells. But like I said earlier, if you just press K, you can see all of your spells and class actions and drag them back onto the hot bar. You don't actually officially lose it. Now, above your hot bar, we have a series series of boxes here representing various different things. The easiest way to get yourself familiar with what all of these things do and what they represent is by entering into turn-based mode. So let's go ahead and enter into turn-based mode. So on your turn, whether you're in combat or entering turn-based mode, you get one action, one bonus action, and one reaction. This little green circle right here represents your action. If it's green, it means you have an action and you haven't used your action yet. If it's gray, then you already used your action for that turn. Now, if you're not sure what you have that is an actual action, simply click on the actual green circle and it will mix and merge all of your hotbar things that require an action. So you can see, you know, using some of my items like this scroll of detect thoughts does use an action and it tells you that in the bottom left description. Also using my spell, mage armor, costs an action and also using some of the common actions costs an action. If I go ahead and use an action, you'll notice that the action now disappears. And on this specific turn, since I'm in turn-based mode, I can no longer use any actions, but I still do have a bonus action available. And to separate all of your bonus actions that you have available on your hotbar, just click on the triangle right here. And you can see I only currently have three. Drinking a potion in this game, as you can see in the description, requires a bonus action. So if I go ahead and drink a potion, that little orange triangle is now gray, and now I've used my action and my bonus action on my turn. Now, since I did mention reactions, well, reactions are not represented on these actual squares right here, but if you press K on any of your characters and then go over to the tab on the right, you can see your reactions. Now, reactions in Baldur's Gate 3 only occur when something triggers them, something specific triggers them. For example, if I go ahead and take a shot at my ranger right here with Gale, 
A pop-up box appears, allowing me to use Missile Snaring, which will reduce damage from a ranged weapon by 1d10 plus my dexterity modifier. And as you can see, it is a reaction. I get to use one of these per round if something triggers that reaction. You don't have to use your reaction. Sometimes you may not want to because you're worried that something else will happen in that same round of combat. Just click on Do Not React. But let's go ahead and click on Missile Snaring. And there you can see I took zero damage. And that particular reaction comes from a piece of gear that my ranger has on my gloves of missile snaring. But other reactions may come from other sources, such as Gal, he has the reaction spell called Shield. When you're about to be hit by an enemy, increase your armor class by five. You take no damage from magic missiles. So this is a wizard spell that Gal has learned. And now anytime anyone attacks him, I can use this reaction to make that hit much more likely to miss Gal. Now keep in mind, some reactions cost more than just a reaction as you can see shield right here also uses up one of my level one spell slots which are limited also note with reactions you can have them automatically go off when a condition or trigger occurs and to have this happen just uncheck the box that says ask right here so if you have the ask box checked a pop-up box will show up just like you saw with missile snaring and then you have to choose if you want to use it or not use it but if you uncheck this missile snaring would have just gone off automatically and another thing that you can do with reactions is you can turn them completely off so if i never ever want to use shield the level one right here i can just click over here on the left side and it will not ask me if i want to use it nor will it use it automatically and last thing to note with reactions if you want a quick idea as to what you have active just look on the right side of your hop bar and then directly above it you can see there's two little boxes right here and this is telling me that gale currently has shield and opportunity attack ready to go as reactions you can also click on these little boxes and it'll bring you right to the reaction menu so on your turn in combat or in turn-based mode your character gets one action and one bonus action and in that round of combat they also get one reaction to the right of this we have something called arcane recovery charge which is specific to the wizard class so this is going to be a box that represents something that recharges on your class so if i switch over to shadow heart right here she doesn't have arcane recovery she has channel divinity and right now i have one channel divinity charge which will power up certain spells that the cleric has to the right of this we then have our spell slot boxes so as you level up you'll start getting access to more powerful spells right now shadowheart has level one spells and level two spell slots available for use and it's telling us right here in the level one box that we have two available level one spell slots out of four total so if i wanted to recharge that and have four out of four available i would take a long rest use those camp supplies come back into the world then we would have four blue boxes right there larian makes it really easy to know what you have that requires a level one spell slot all you gotta do is click on that actual box then you can see all the spells that i have right here that cost a level one spell slot now if we click on the level two box you can see all the spells that i have right here that can use a level two spell slot these spells tend to be more powerful than level one spells you may notice some spells that are in level one and level two both and that is because some spells can be upcasted meaning you can cast guiding bolt as a level one spell and it only does four to 24 damage but you can also cast it as a level two spell and that damage goes up to five to 30 damage now also note when you click on a spell if it can be upcasted you will see the little plus sign right there if i click on inflict wounds you can see i have the option to cast it as a level one spell or a level two spell which is more powerful these spell slots are limited like i said they recharge on a long rest unless you're playing the warlock class which recharges their spell slots on a short rest and you guys should know how to take a short rest by now just click on the campfire icon and then click on the top little button right here that says short rest and to the right of your spell slot boxes if your character has cantrips and cantrips are spells that do not use a spell slot you can cast them at will you can click on that little box and then up will pop all of your available cantrips when you run out of spell slots cantrips become your best friend to the left of your hot bar we have your melee weapon and your ranged weapon and whatever skills come with that particular weapon will be shown in your common part of your hot bar now you can switch from your melee to your range simply by pressing f or you can click on these little buttons right here and you can pull out your light source if you have a torch in your character's inventory in this little torch slot right here and all you gotta do is click on that button and your character will pull out a torch making dungeon delving much much easier to the left of your weapons we have your character's portrait and as they take damage that portrait will fill up in red as you can see with gal right here he is almost filled completely in red letting you know it is time to heal and then to the left 
left of that, we have a button that basically just brings you to your inventory and equipment, and you better just get used to using the I key, because clicking on that all the time is just a waste of time, so just click I, and then you can get to your inventory and equipment, and above that little circle, you'll be able to see any conditions that your character currently has, so if they're poisoned, you'll be able to see a little poison box, or if you have certain passives toggled, like non-lethal attacks, it shows you right here that that is actually toggled on. Now let's talk about what happens when your character goes down. So each round of combat, your character that is downed is going to do a death saving throw. Really easy to understand. Basically, on the back end, the game is going to give you a random number between 1 and 20. If you get a 10 or higher, you succeed. If you get a 9 or lower, you fail. If you can get three successes, your character will enter into a stable state. This doesn't mean that they stand up, but they don't outright die. If you get three failures before you get three success rolls, then your character actually does die and they require an actual resurrection. The cool thing is when a character is in a down state, if they receive any healing at all, they will stand up. So you can see my character is down right here. If I switch over to Shadow Heart and I use the healing word spell, my character will stand back up, but probably with fairly low HP. But there's also another thing that you can do. If you don't have a healing spell available, you can actually throw potions in this game. So let me go ahead and grab a potion. We're going to throw this potion right at my character on the ground right here and you'll see what happens. And they automatically succeed on their death saves and they stand back up and I currently have 7 HP. There's also the help action that every character has access to and that is in your common tab right here. And if you click on help and then you click on a character that's downed, it will stand them back up. Now let's talk a little bit about spellcasters. So some spellcaster classes, as you level up, you have to choose specific spells and those are the only spells that you have access to. While other classes use prepared spells and these classes are clerics, druids, paladins, and wizards. If you're playing a prepared caster, you have access to a ton of spells, but you do have to swap them in and out, and you can do this when you're outside of combat. So if you're not in combat, press K, and this will bring up your spell list. Right here you can see the cleric spell list for Shadowheart, and I can simply select and deselect these spells, and the spells that you have active at that given time are in this highlighted row right here, and the row below this are all of your available level 1 spells, and the ones that have the gold square around them are the ones you have prepared, and the ones that don't are the ones that you need to prepare if you want to use them. So for example, if I wanted to have the command spell, I would have to unprepare one of these spells. So let's go ahead and unprepare create or destroy water, it goes away from the top row right here and then I simply click on command and now you can see it right there and it's available for use as long as I have a spell slot. Now let's talk about inventory and equipment. If you press I it will bring up the inventory and equipment for the character that you currently have selected. If you press tab it will bring up your entire party and then on the top of the screen you can change from inventory to spell book to your character's sheet. The summary tab is a great way to see your character's ability scores, also to see if they're resistant or vulnerable to any particular type of damage. And then below that, the notable features are a collection of all your racial features, these inherent features that certain races get, such as me having dark vision as a wood elf, and also some of the choices that you make as you level up your class may give you special, you know, inherent class features, I guess you could say, such as my ranger having ranger knight, which gives him proficiency in history and proficiency with heavy armor. The second tab is the skills tab. So basically, if you want a quick look at what skills your character is good at or not good at, just click on this tab, then you can see whatever has the highest number here are the skills that your character is going to be the best at. For example, my ranger right here has a plus five in athletics. So any athletics check, I'm gonna be really good at while my investigation is at minus one. So whenever there's an investigation skill check in the game, I'm actually losing one off of the dice roll, making it much harder to succeed. Succeed. And the third tab is a more detailed view where you can see all sorts of things such as proficiency with certain weapons, hit points, your movement speed, and things of that nature. When you're looking at your inventory, don't forget that there is a sort by button right here and you can sort by latest, so whatever you picked up most recently, value, weight, and type. And also in your inventory, you should have a camp supply pack where all of your food supplies are going to automatically be stored. You'll have an alchemy pouch where all of the alchemy ingredients that you pick up are going to automatically be stored and go into. And also you're gonna have a keychain where any key that you pick up will go onto the keychain. As you progress through the game, you're also gonna find regular backpacks and you can use those backpacks for whatever you would like. Maybe put weapons into one of the backpacks or put potions into one of the backpacks to keep things nicely organized. 
Also note that you can right click on any item in your inventory and if you click on send to camp it will send it to the chest in your camp so you don't have to manually bring it there yourself. If you want to send multiple items to camp at one time instead of doing them individually simply hold down control and click on the items that you want to select and highlight and then right click and send to camp and they will all disappear. Splitting a stack of items is also quite easy as you can see I have four health potions right here if I hold down shift and then I grab the health potions pull down then let go the split stack menu comes up and then you just confirm what split you want and it's that easy now let's talk about your character's armor class so the higher your armor class number is the harder it is going to be for enemies to land their attacks on you as you can see right here Shadowheart has a 14 armor class if we take a look at her chain shirt it says that the chain shirt gives us 13 armor class but in the bottom of this chain shirt's description it says ac bonus from dexterity limited to plus two so medium armor takes into account your dexterity modifier and Shadowheart's dexterity modifier right now at 13 is a plus one. So I have 13 plus one in dexterity and that gives her 14 total armor class. Now shields in the game will give you another plus two onto your armor class. So if I take this shield and drag it into the shield slot, my AC now goes to 16. And when I reach level 4 with Shadowheart, if I increase my dexterity to 14, that will boost that dexterity modifier to plus 2, and then my armor class will then be 17. And just going up by one point in armor class is actually a pretty significant upgrade. Also note that certain spells in the game may put a temporary armor class boost effect on your character, such as Shadowheart's Shield of Faith right here. If I cast Shield of Faith on herself or on another character, it increases their armor class by two as long as that caster is concentrating on that spell. But what is a concentration spell? So if you look at your spell's description, some of your spells are going to require concentration. When you cast a concentration spell, that spell can stay active for an extended period of of time so you cast it one time and it can stay active for as long as you can hold your concentration unless it says otherwise some spells do have a time limit such as bless will only last for up to 10 turns so let's go ahead and cast bless with shadow heart and shadow heart is now concentrating on bless and you can see this because in the bottom left of her portrait you can see bless right there and if i wanted to end this spell i could click on that little x right there otherwise the spell will end after 10 turns or one minute when you're not actually in combat or in turn-based mode now concentration spells can end earlier than that when the spellcaster takes damage if they fail in a concentration saving throw that spell will also end so let's go ahead and take a swing at shadow heart here and whenever she takes damage, she'll do the concentration saving throw. And you can see it right there, but she succeeded in that concentration saving throw. So Bless is currently still active. If she were to fail in that role, Bless would end. Now you can only concentrate on one concentration spell at a time. So if you have a spellcaster that has nothing but concentration spells, you're probably not really effectively using that character. But there's a lot of great concentration spells, especially ones to open up a combat encounter with, that you can try to keep active and then use other spells throughout the encounter while keeping your concentration spells active. For example, Bless is a great spell to cast at the start of a combat encounter. And after I cast it with Shadowheart, the next turn that she has, I can use Guiding Bolt and I can turn back into doing damage and things of that nature while bless remains active now let's take a quick look at your character's encumbrance levels if you press i and go into your inventory at the bottom of the inventory you can see the encumbrance bar if you're all the way over here to the right in the red your character is heavily encumbered and this comes with a ton of disadvantages as you can see right here at the red weight right there and gal moves super super slow now if you're in the yellow your character still moves pretty dang slow, but you don't suffer from nearly as many disadvantages. And of course, the goal is to not be encumbered at all so you can move freely and you can jump super far and you're not really at any disadvantage at all. And the last thing that I want to talk about in this video, because there's already so much information to take in, is understanding if you are proficient in weapons or armor, because putting on the right armor and on the right weapons or equipping the right weapons actually makes a pretty big deal. So as you can see, I have Gale in his purple whitey tights right now, and I'm going to go ahead and put Gith Yankee half plate on him. And it may look cool and the game does let you equip it, but all of his spells at the bottom right down here on the hot bar have now grayed out. I cannot cast spells because Gale is not 
proficient in medium armor. He's not proficient in armor at all. What Gal can wear is robes or clothes. So if we click on the little box where the armor is, you can see our choices here. And you're going to look for something that doesn't have that yellow, not proficient with medium armor explanation point, such as these simple robes right here. And now we have robes on, which boost our armor class. And all of my spells are currently lit up. Now, this also works with weapons as well. You want to use weapons that you're proficient in, because if you use a weapon that you're not proficient in, you don't get that proficiency bonus on your attacks and you're much more likely to miss. So I can equip a scimitar on Gale right now and he can be a pretty badass looking wizard. But if I make a scimitar attack, I'm going to be suffering from not getting that proficiency bonus and I'm going to be missing quite a lot just like with the armor at the bottom of your weapons description it tells you if you're proficient or not proficient so with gal we want to take off the scimitar and we're going to select something such as a quarter staff if you want to see all of the weapons and armor that your characters are proficient in simply click on the character sheet and then go over here to the detailed view if you scroll down you can see proficiency bonus plus two and if you scroll over armor it tells you that this character gal is proficient with light armor and shields for simple weapons he has four proficiencies daggers light crossbows quarter staffs and spears and then for martial weapons gale is proficient with glaives halberds and pikes thank you all so much for watching i'll have a beginner's guide to combat video out in the very near future and also a ton of class guides and builds and all that good stuff and if you're interested in a let's play series i have been releasing episodes right here on this channel i'll catch you on the next one